All right, thanks. So we've talked extensively about both the flathead and the blue catfish. I'll touch on a couple, a little bit of background. Um, they're native to the Mississippi drainages, but have been introduced uh, to much of the continental U.S. They are top predators um, in terms of size. They're top five largest. Um, we've seen some of these max sizes that really uh, push for these trophy fisheries. Um, and the flathead specifically has this large gape size, which isn't restricting it um, from any prey species. They both are predators, flathead higher, mostly piscivorous, but the blue catfish have seen some broader generalist foraging um, habits. And they're introduced to the Atlantic Slope here in the late 60s and 70s. Looking at foraging in just North Carolina rivers, rivers they were established in 1966, stocked by the state. Um, and by the 1980s, we saw broad age and size structure. Most of the diet samples were dominated by fish and macroinvertebrates, um, a mixture of crayfish and other aquatic inverts. We did start to see evidence for impacts on native fish, um, the native ichthylurids, a loss of white catfish and bullheads, a loss of centrarchids, um, a lot of redbreast sun fisheries in the lower part of the state, and the predation on clupades, um, those are low scenes that we've heard about. And Pine did an uh, ecosim model in 2007 that showed with low mortality rates on these introduced flathead, they had the ability to um, reduce some of our native sport fish by up to 50%, which was troubling. Um, all of these were referring to flathead dives. We've seen limited studies of blue catfish on the coastal tributaries. We've seen them in some of the inland reservoirs, um, but really our, our data is limited on these coastal tributaries. Some of our objectives were first to look at the trophic ecology, looking at stomach contents and stable isotopes. We wanted to see if there are any species specific differences between the two, any spatial variation between our three tributaries. Um, and we're gonna look at these uh, three stable isotopes. The carbon, which generally tells us the base of the food web and can be identified as the habitat that they're using. Nitrogen, which is gonna tell us trophic level and enriches um, by, your, by size and the sulfur, which tells us contribution of marine prey um, coming inland. We also wanted to look at the extent of the anadromous fish that they were utilizing. Um, so we were taking a focus on spring diets, and we wanted to see if those carbon and sulfur isotopes were possibly enriched after eating um, these anadromous fish. Our sampling approach, we use low frequency electrofishing in the three tributaries of Lower Cape Fear, um, the main stem Cape Fear, the Black River, both Piedmont rivers running inland, and the Northeast Cape Fear, which is um, the coastal, coastal plain tributary. We have two years worth of sampling um, for stomachs. We brought back all flathead and blue catfish. There's no restrictions on take for them. And we processed all these for size, diet, and took tissue analysis for those stable isotopes. A little look at the distribution. Um, flathead were pretty well distributed across the three tributaries. The Black River is the smallest of the three tributaries and didn't have those larger size ranges. Um, Cape Fear and the Black had a pretty good size distribution. But on Northeast Cape Fear, we saw a lot of these medium to larger size individuals. For blue catfish, our data was truncated a little bit. Um, the low frequency electrofishing was really good for those small size class of blues. Um, but we we're really missing out on the upper size classes. On the Cape Fear, we were able to partner with WRC and NCDMF and use some high frequency electrofishing in early spring months, which kind of gave us a broader size distribution on the Cape Fear. Looking at frequency of occurrence for flathead, the first thing that pops out is this utilization of fish across tributary. Um, these aren't just bluegill, it's a wide range and mix of fish, um, but they were really um, generally piscivorous. But also what stands out are these macroinvertebrates. Um, combined, they have made up just as much as the fish did, about 50%. We're surprised to see these macrobrachium species, which are freshwater river prawn, which were heavily utilized um, that we hadn't heard about before. They did show up in some of the Georgia diets. Um, they identified them as macrobrachium rosenbergi, which is the large river prawn. Ours, we um, assume, might be Macrobrachium ohioni, um, but we need to do some DNA to see if that is correct. And we also see some distinct tributary differences already emerging. A uh, lack of crayfish um, supplemented by the prawn on the Cape Fear, and then in reverse on the northeast, uh, an increase in crayfish 
and crayfish and a little bit less use of the prong. If we look at this across antogeny um, with increasing size, we see that in the smaller size classes, they are utilizing those aquatic inverts and insects, um, but those really taper out as they get larger. In the middle size classes here, we see a strong dependence on those um, crustaceans, the mix of the prawn and the crayfish, and piscivory throughout, um, even in the smaller size classes, but really ramping up here um, in the upper size classes, while there still are smaller amounts, but they are not strictly piscivorous um, throughout ontogeny, which is kind of what we started to see um, from the Virginia studies. For blue catfish, um, the main story for blue catfish is the corbicula. Um, a little bit difference between tributaries, but really we were surprised when we didn't see corbicula in a blue catfish stomach. They came back, they had rocky stomachs, we knew instantly that they were going to be chock full of clams. We do see fish at low amounts across tributary, nothing too significant. Um, but then once again, the Northeast Cape Fear was a little bit different. We saw higher abundance of insects, utilization of clams and the prawns. And it was a broader prey community that we were seeing on the, the Northeast Cape Fear. Um, across size range, really the corbicular, the main story here. High frequency for all size classes, really only dropping out for the larger size classes. Insects were utilized um, across all size classes. And the fish really weren't utilized a whole lot in lower size classes, um, but then increased exponentially as we got past about 500 millimeters. Looking at the presence or absence of fish, um, we see both flathead here in the orange and the blue. Um, in the blue are mainly piscivorous in these upper size classes. Flathead um, shift a little bit sooner, but we do see that they're piscivorous even in those smaller size classes with um, a shift to stronger piscivory at about 500. And for blue catfish, a stronger shift to piscivory at about 800. Blue, we're seeing this strong shift, not utilizing fish at smaller size classes. So it's really these larger blue catfish that are one heavily preying on the fish. We had a lot of unidentified stomach contents, um, as Megan talked about a little earlier, um, but some of the main families that we were able to distinguish for the flatheads, we saw a lot of hog chokers occupying that same benthic habitat as the flathead. We saw the centrarchids, largemouth, and sunfish um, that were talked about in earlier studies in the 80s and 90s in the lower Cape Fear. We had two large individuals of largemouth bass over a pound in some of these fish. All species of ictalurids for the flathead, including blue and flathead catfish, a lot of juvenile blue catfish, and a couple um, bullhead species that we weren't able to take to species level. Um, and also the coupades, American shad and gizzard shad, which Virginia saw heavy use of the gizzard shad. And blue catfish really weren't a whole lot of um, fish contribution, but we did see the sunfish. We saw a lot of small juvenile blue catfish, a lot of gizzard shad, and a couple larger American eels. We ran a couple dietary indices um, to really quantify them in another metric instead of stomachs. We looked at diet overlap between the two, and this was really low. We didn't see much diet overlap. The, most of these metrics were dominated by corbicula for the blue catfish. And because the flathead weren't preying on that level, we didn't see diet overlap with them. Um, a normal trophic level, this is estimated from um, um, indices from fish base. We took the trophic level for their prey and back calculated them to the predators. Flathead were at this higher trophic level, which we expected to see. Blue catfish were, were more omni omnivorous um, in that lower trophic level. And these were a little surprising to us. The diet breadth and the omnivory index were really low for both of these species. And in, in the Virginia waters, blue catfish were highly omnivorous um, with a large diet breadth preying on a lot of diet items. We saw on the, on the lower Cape Fear, their diet was mainly corbicula. They didn't eat a whole lot of other things. On the Northeast, they had a mix of inquata invertebrates, but even on the Northeast, their diet was dominated by corbicula. We saw a little bit higher diet breadth for the flathead. Um, they were using those crustaceans as well as fish, um, but in terms of omnivory index, it was really low. They, by weight, their stomachs were dominated by those fish. Taking an early look at the isotopes, the flathead, if we look at nitrogen, which is our trophic level, 
Flat had distinguished themselves at that higher trophic level with a blue catfish. <laughs> I'm at a lower trophic level. This uh, agreed with our trophic position estimate from the diet, um, where the flatheads were higher and the blue catfish were lower. Um, so this is kind of what we expected to see, these flathead up there in the top trophic level and the blue catfish a little bit lower. Looking between um, tributaries to see if there are any spatial differences, we start to see that the Northeast Cape Fear um, is a little bit different than the Black and the Cape Fear up here. They had a significantly lower um, nitrogen level, and we saw that the Black and the Cape Fear were a little bit more carbon enriched. So we're starting to see these tributaries really piece out from each other spatially here. Um, with body size, we then saw a significant increase in carbon um, as these fish got bigger, and not just flathead, but also these blue catfish. Their carbon signatures were becoming really enriched um, with more carbon. And the nitrogen, we saw similar trends. Um, you can see the trophic difference between the flatheads and the blues, but this was more what we expected to see, um, oxygenetic shift to more piscivory with larger size plaques showing up in the nitrogen. But we also saw a pretty strong spread in the smaller size classes of flatheads. Um, you could be uh, under 300 millimeters and still have these really high nitrogen signatures. So we are seeing piscivory even at those smallest size classes. This was kind of um, pushed by one of the tributaries specifically. If you look at um, the Cape Fear and the Black River, there really wasn't a strong increase in that nitrogen. Even those smaller fish were utilizing fish as prey, and they weren't shifting um, ontogenetically from those aquatic invertebrates. And that's really what we were seeing on the Northeast Cape Fear. A lot of lower level nitrogen signatures in those smaller fish, and then an increase up in those larger size classes. We talked about this earlier a little bit with the difference um, in frequency of occurrence of prey. And we also kind of start to see these Piedmont rivers, which are running west and inland, um, have a little bit of different assemblage and a little bit uh, different isotopic uh, enrichment than the Northeast Cape Fear, this coastal plain river. So we started to see a couple data points that we wanted to test out. Um, originally, I was expecting that the carbon enrichment was just going to be a downriver to upriver thing. But when they lived lower river, they had more enriched carbon. When they lived upper river, they had less enriched carbon. But early on, we could tell that it wasn't a downriver to upriver shift. I was seeing enri carbon enrichment values all over the place. It wasn't um, due, to, due to location. And we saw some of these blue catfish, our largest blue catfish here, um, had a, the most carbon enrichment out of most of our fish. So we started to wonder, these high, high nitrogen signatures, so higher level predators, and uh, enriched, highly enriched carbon What's going on with this box up here? Um, something was a little bit different. That's where the sulfur kind of came into play. Um, the sulfur and carbon um, were both related. We see this correlation between the two. When we have enriched carbon, we also are seeing the enriched uh, sulfur. And we also saw that the Cape Fear in the Northeast were a little bit different in these sulfur comparisons. More enriched sulfur in the Cape Fear and less enriched sulfur in the Northeast Cape Fear. Um, so this could be the difference in prey communities, um, especially the anadromous fish we're expecting are bringing those sulfur and carbon signatures to the upper river. We took a look at the prey community. Um, we had a lot of our flathead and blue catfish, um, but we also did some high frequency sampling with WRC and we're able to get prey items. And we see a broad range um, of trophic positions. The top level piscivores are distinguishing themselves here at the top. Um, we have our omnivores here in the middle, bluegill, white bass, and blue catfish, which are omnivorous. And then we're seeing this lower level uh, distinguish itself, our hog chokers and mummy chogs, anything that's eating detritus or plankton are going to be at that lowest trophic level. We also started to see a little difference here across the carbon, and we have these really freshwater signatures, which are less enriched in carbon, and then we have these mobile prey, um, gizzard shad, mullet, and American shad, which are utilizing the lower estuary, the, um, the American shad are coming inshore from offshore, and that's showing up in their carbon signatures. So 
if we have a top level predator that's going to eat one of these mobile prey, it is going to shift them from this freshwater signature to this um, enriched carbon signature that we started to see between the different rivers. So that box I talked about earlier, if it's a high level consumer and it's eating these anadromous fish, it's going to have upper level nitrogen signature and highly enriched carbon. So some of the conclusions, flathead are obviously at this highest tropic position. Um, we have a consistent use of fish prey throughout ontogeny, um, like they've seen in the Virginia rivers. They were, however, utilizing these macroinvertebrates that they were seeing more similar to in Georgia, um, eating a lot of crayfish and prawns. And we started to see increased use of anadromous marine prey um, with size. We also saw the Cape Fear was distinguishing itself a little bit as having more anadromous fish prey available to it. Blue catfish were more of that intermediate trophic position. Um, really, the story there was the curricula, really dependent upon those curricula. We do have a port on the port city in Wilmington, which um, could be a vector for introduction for these corbicula, which could give us a higher um, population of corbicula. But that was also similar to what we they've seen in Georgia. Less, a lot less omnivorous than in Chesapeake tributaries. We really only saw a couple dominant prey groups um, really distinguished by that corbicula. Mm -hmm. And a really late ontogenetic shift to piscivory which could show they're less detrimental to these native fish communities and at larger size classes where they'd be removing that prey. And we also start wanted to note the important tributary level effects. <coughs> the Cape Fear and the Black River, which are seeing a little bit more anadromous fish, um, was showing in the stable isotopes. The Northeast Cape Fear River, which might have a little bit different prey community um, in the prey. We've talked a lot about what could be done about these introduced predators because they're removing all these native fish. We've seen the passive removal, um, no regulations that restrict removal, but no, no real incentive to harvest. Um, that takes a lot of communication with stakeholders. We've talked about the trophy fisheries who really want to promote those larger size classes, but we have seen how detrimental they are um, in the stomachs. And we've seen consumption advisory, especially for the larger size classes of fish, bioaccumulating these toxins, so it's hard to really tell people to remove those. Um, we could in, there could be incentivized removal, high reward tags or gift, gift cards like we kind of saw with the snakehead, um, trying to get people out there in more of a game, like let's try and catch these fish and remove them. And we also saw the active removal uh, by agency staff, not by recreational or commercial fishermen. So this takes a lot of effort. Um, we saw in Georgia they were able to truncate that population size, remove those larger individuals. Um, South Carolina is using a little bit less rigorous of removal. And they're seeing a little bit less population truncation. North Carolina, who just released their management plan, are using different management zones across the state. They are native in the western portion of the state, and we do have a lot of large reservoirs where they're promoting that trophy fishery but most of the coastal tributaries are on the, under the invasive catfish reduction. Um, but also we're currently passive removal. We're not incentivizing that removal, um, but we're not restricting it either. Some other options um, could be a look at these tributaries as independent units, a little bit like what they're doing in Georgia. If we can identify um, where we really want to protect imaginous fish, striped bass and shad, we could protect those rivers, look at targeted removal, if we then want to have a trophy fishery on another, um, another tributary, that could be effective there. Um, but we need to look at more data on these fish stocks um, about that. And the research isn't done yet. We do need to see the extent of their use in the lower tributary, how much they're overlapping with these estuarine species, how much they're utilizing the brackish water like they're seeing on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and we do have some future work. We just uh, got a new student that will do DNA barcoding. So we can see some of these species specific impacts that we weren't able to see at a broad scale with all those unidentified fish prey. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the whole lab. This was a huge effort um, by the whole SHARF lab. Um, I was running stable isotopes at CMS and got a lot of help with that. Um, and I also was assisted by NCWRC and NCDMF um, using some high frequency sampling. Thank you.